let me ask you, have any of you or some of you read the series I've been writing in the last three or four or five months on the Grail in the Oracle each month? I think I've got four installments, so if you've read some of that, you should kind of have the gist of what my particular interpretation of the whole thing is. What's my background on this? Well, I've done lots and lots and lots of study over 40 years into various esoteric traditions. The Grail is something I got very interested in after travels in Europe in the late 80s, and I visited a lot of sites that were associated either historically or through legends with the Grail. And then I came back and subsequently over the years I've been immersed myself in some of the strange and exotic Grail literature out of the Middle Ages. And believe that I've come up with a perhaps somewhat original interpretation of what that uh, bizarre, relatively bizarre symbolism actually represents. Now, have any of you ever read any of the Grail stories, the Grail romances as they're called? Um, some of the well-known authors, um, Chrétien de Troyes was the French author who um, wrote, I think he was probably the one of the earliest. Um, Robert Deberon was another one who, interestingly, was known to be one of the Templar Knights. And if you know anything about uh, European history, Western history, you know that the Templar Knights were a pivotal role in, in the shift out of the Dark Ages into the modern age, if you will. Wolfram von Eschenbach is my favorite. He has really uh, developed some of the, the, the deeper and, and cosmic symbolism of the Grail. And then there's quite a, there's Thomas Mallory. Um, how many of you ever seen the movie by John Borman entitled Excalibur? That is based upon Thomas Mallory's reading of the, of the Grail stories. If you start <clears throat> getting into these Grail stories, what you discover is there's a wide variety of perspectives. And you cannot get the sense of really what the Grail is by simply reading one of them. Um, clearly, uh, most people's concept of the Grail is this right here. This, this is actually a chalice that is now being preserved at Reims Cathedral. Nobody, I don't think, really believes that was the Grail, but it's a, it's a good image for what most people think of the Grail as a chalice or a cup. And if you know the story, um, there was actually a pre-Christian, uh, a pagan version of the Grail that goes back to Celtic times. And this was generally known as the Cauldron of Luch. And he was one of the Celtic gods who had this massive cauldron in which universal medicines were cooked that uh, <clears throat> could then be used for the healing of the gods and healing of the uh, the wasteland. Um, then the Christian version of it came along, you know, probably in the first or second century, but it was not actually written down until the Middle Ages. All of the Grail romances, and there's probably close to two dozen of them um, in various languages, were all written between 1180 and 1230 AD. <clears throat> now, this is a very, very interesting time in history because <clears throat> there was an incredible amount of creative ferment bubbling in Western civilization and, and a spiritual awakening that occurred at that time. And if you know anything about that period, you probably know that this was the, the apex of this uh, period of the Gothic building, the cathedral building era, uh, that actually began around the year 1130 um, with the building of Notre Dame Cathedral at St. Denis, and then from there, it, it, it rapidly expanded within one generation so that there were 80 of these giant, magnificent monuments under construction and about 500 smaller abbeys <clears throat> that were all pretty much constructed between, like I said, uh, around 1130 was the first one, and they went right up to the early 1300s when this, this phenomena suddenly just ended as, as almost as quickly as it began. And I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the timing and the tempo of this and to try to place it in a, a larger context so you understand um, the social and uh, natural forces that, that were in confluence at that time that, that made these things possible. You may also know that this was the time of the, the Cathar movement uh, in southern France 
um, that in the Cathars, like the Templars, have been associated with the Grail. Um, and in fact, we'll be looking at some slides of that um, at Montsegur, which is southern France. This was one of the last holdouts of the Cathars before they were completely suppressed um, by, the, by the church. Uh, in the early 1300s. And it was, legend associates that place with the Grail and said that this was one of the hiding places of the Grail. It was also the time of the, the, the rise of the Kabbalistic schools in Spain um, that were served as sort of a bridge between the Middle East and, and Western Europe. You know that during this time is when, uh, you know, the Crusades, you know perhaps the story of the Templars' journey to uh, the Holy Land, um, ostensibly to protect the pilgrim routes against uh, brigands and bandits and so on. But when they got there to Jerusalem, and this would have been in the year 1100 and about the year 1118, they actually presented themselves to King Baldwin II, and he then gave them lodging in a wing of his palace that was actually adjacent to the ruins of King Solomon's temple. Shortly after their arrival, he went off on a crusade and abandoned the whole site to the Templars. The original nine Templars who were at that site actually never, it's, there's no record of them actually policing the highways. What they apparently did was perhaps what you could call the first uh, archaeological excavation. And they spent nine years excavating in the ruins of King Solomon's temple. And in the year 1128, they returned to France <clears throat> Their trip was sponsored under the auspices of, of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. When they got back, there was a big conference held and all kinds of accolades about the success of their mission, but nobody really knows what exactly was the purpose of their mission. However, two years after their return, in 1128, work began on the first of the High Gothic cathedrals with this quantum leap, if you will, in architectural and in engineering skill. Has anybody ever traveled in Europe and seen any of the, the High Gothic cathedrals such as Chartres or Notre Dame or Amiens? Yeah, okay, we're talking about really a, 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 an amazing advance over uh, the architectural systems that preceded it, which were basically very simple in their structural uh, systems, mostly just compression. If you look at a simple, um, you know, horizontal lintel on two columns, that's a very simple structural system. An arch is a little bit more complex. An ogival vault, though, is a totally different matter. An ogival vault is actually channeling tensional forces to the earth, not compressional. Now, if you know the difference, compression is shortening the fibers of a, of a system, right? Tension is stre stretching, elongating. And you know that in a musical instrument, a stringed instrument, in order to play notes, you have to put those strings under tension. And in the Gothic cathedral, what they did was they came up with a way of, they came up with a formula for mortar that once it hardened was as strong or stronger than the stone itself. So when they put these stones into the vault, and mortared them together, once it's set up, you had essentially an integral mass acting as a unit. Now, if you can picture, and we we'll, can look at some slides here, the Ogival vault comes to a point, and it has a very unique geometry. It's one of the things that I teach people when we do our sacred geometry workshops, is how they derive the cross section of the Ogival vault. Some of you may know what a vesica piscis is. A vesica is the overlap of two circles such that the circumference of one falls on the center of the other. In that overlap area, what if you know if you have a mathematical background, you can think of a Venn diagram. It's the, the overlap of those two circles is the vesica. Well, if you take the top half of the vesica, that is oftentimes the proportions that are used for the vault in a Gothic cathedral. Not always, there are variants on that. Like in Chartres Cathedral, it's actually a pentagram that's used to develop the proportions of the vault. But in any case, the vault was a quantum leap above the earlier structural systems that had been in use in, in history. Now what's interesting about this, this era is that you had, you had, like I said, 80 of these great monuments, 500 lesser abbeys, and, and essentially the, the enterprise began 
almost overnight, you had all of this construction work going on. And when you begin to realize and, and think about the, uh, the resources and the manpower and the knowledge that had to be integrated to pull this thing off, it is truly phenomenal. It is truly, truly phenomenal. We are talking about hundreds of highly skilled craftspeople involved in this. And we're not just talking about the people quarrying the stone, right? Then shaping the stone, assembling the stone. We're also talking about the carpenters that could build the scaffolding that was needed and build the formwork that had to be constructed for this. You had glaziers who could create stained glass windows whose refractory properties have, have eluded optical scientists to this day. And the, one of the unique properties of these stained glass windows is the way they refract light. Normally a stained glass window, when you look at it, it appears that the light is coming through the glass. In these cathedrals, like in Chartres and many of the others, it appears as if the light is coming out of the glass. It has very unusual refractory properties. And to, to my knowledge, no one ex with, except with one exception in, in modern times has been able to duplicate that glass. Interestingly, the individual that was able to do that was Schwaller de Lubitsch. Do you know who Schwaller de Lubitsch is? Schwaller de Lubitsch was a maverick Egyptologist who spent years in Egypt studying the science of, of ancient Egypt. And he was the guy who first looked at the Sphinx Everybody knows the Sphinx, right? And by now, hopefully everybody knows that the Sphinx is severely water eroded, right? Well, he was the first guy who looked at the Sphinx and saw the obvious and said, you know what, the Sphinx is water eroded. I think this was back in the early 50s when he said that. This, that, that, uh, and, and it was in one of his, uh, one of his works, um, that he published, it was then followed up by John Anthony West in the 1970s who picked up on the idea that Schwaller de Lubitsch had, had remarked on about the age of the Sphinx because the, 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 the conventional chronologies places the Sphinx at 43 to 4,500 years old. But the entire time that the Sphinx has been sitting on the Giza Plateau, it's been in high desert country. But the Sphinx itself is severely water eroded. When was Egypt or nor the Giza Plateau area is subject to major rainfall that could cause such erosion, you have to go back 10, 12,000 years ago and longer. So anyway, Schwaller de Lubitsch, that same guy, was probably the only guy in modern times who was able to duplicate this, the, the unique refractory properties of this high Gothic glass, stained glass that they were doing, which is very interesting to me. Also during this time, it was the time, like I mentioned, the Templar Knights, you know, their, their organization, which was first formed in 1118 by 1150, had grown enormously and became essentially one of the wealthiest organizations in Europe. And it is very likely that the, that the Templar Knights were essentially the, uh, the administrative end of this enterprise. So they were also probably the ones providing the financing and the banking. You know, essentially modern banking traces its origins back to the systems implemented by the, the Templar Knights because, you know, they were the ones who basically set up the, the trade routes and policed the trade routes between the Middle East and Western Europe. And they were the ones who basically said, if you're a merchant and you're carrying, uh, you know, some, some valuables to the Middle East, you sell them there, right? Instead of getting a bunch of gold and having to carry a bunch of gold back with them where they would now be subject to being, uh, you know, attacked and robbed, the Templars, they would go to a chapter house in Jerusalem or wherever in the Middle East. They would be given script that they could then take back to France, present at the chapter house Templar back there in exchange for the gold. So they didn't have to actually carry the gold, see? So it was the Templars that implemented a system like this and, and literally the origins of modern banking trace back to th those systems of the Middle Ages. It was also the time of the troubadours. And if you know anything about the troubadours, you know, ostensibly to the outer world, they appeared to basically be entertainers. The troubadours were the vehicle by which knowledge and information was transmitted around Europe of the Middle Ages, right? They were, in effect, kind of like the internet of their time. 
So they would go around from town to town and from, from, from manor to manor, and they would be carrying news and, you know, telling about current events and what was going on. And they were also entertainers. But on top of that, and underlying their, their outer ostensible mission was that they were carrying esoteric knowledge. They were the, the bearers of these, this, this deep, profound spiritual knowledge. And they had developed a secret language whose origins probably trace back to ancient Egypt and even earlier. Um, a, a type of Argo or Cant, whereby I have written about this in the series of articles I did for the Oracle, which if you haven't read those, they're all posted on my website, Sacred Geometry International. So you can go on there and you can read those, and I would highly recommend it. In there, I go into this language, which was called the Lying Verte, or the Green Language. It was called the Language of the Birds, the Language of the Diplomats. It went by a number of different names, but it, it, it was a complicated system, and I'm not going to get too much into that tonight, but it was, it was the means whereby the troubadours could communicate secretly. And it was, it was designed in such a way that it had multiple layers. So that, for example, let's take a modern example. Uh, smugglers of any type, uh, let's say drug dealers, have developed a cant, an argo, so that they can talk about stuff and their conversation sounds innocent enough to somebody listening in. But really to somebody who has the key, they understand that you know, what you're really talking about is something else, right? So this type of a language has, has actually been not only the, the prerogatives of like the troubadours who used it for spiritual purposes, but also people who were outcasts from society or outlaws oftentimes. But in any case, they had this, this language called, sometimes called the language of the birds, which is a, a, an interesting illusion because what do basically birds do? They fly, don't they? that was also called the language of the diplomats. And what do diplomats do? Don't they travel in foreign countries and act as a liaison between two different groups of people, two different societies, two different cultures, etc.? So these are kind of hints, I think, that, uh, that where this language originated. Um, it sometimes has been referred to as the language of the thieves, right? Because it was like uh, full, the, 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 the last great 20th century alchemist, Fulcanelli, wrote about this extensively. And uh, said that it was also a language used by alchemists. Because alchemy is, of course, based upon these, these, inter, these multidimensional interpretations of symbols. So my point is that you had all of this incredible stuff going on in this century to a century and a half period. The Templars, the Troubadours, the Cathars, the Kabbalistic schools. And if you've studied Kabbalah at all, you'll know that Kabbalah uses a very complex series of layered symbolism. It uses numbers, it uses uh, various kinds of alliterations and puns and plays on words. This was kind of the basis of the secret language or the Lang Verte, the, the, the language of the birds. So that when you heard, for example, even the, the term we use, Argo, you know, the, if you look up in the dictionary, Argo means a, 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 a language that is only understood by people who have been initiated and given the key to understanding this language, Argo, right? But you also know that Argo, from your Greek mythology, was the ship that Jason sailed on in his quest for the Golden Fleece, right? Well, right there, that's an that's a alchemical allegory, the Golden Fleece. Purely the whole, the whole story of, Ar, uh, of Jason and his quest for the... Uh, golden Fleece is an alchemical allegory. Now, at the basis of the Grail story is the idea of the quest, right? Everybody, how many of you here have seen uh, Monty Python? <laughs> right? Okay. Well, believe it or not, there actually is some legitimate Grail symbolism that they wove into that silly narrative. Um, that's not the one I recommend at the front end, you know, to, um, you know, because like if you read the romances uh, by the authors I mentioned, like there is no mention in there whatsoever of the holy hand grenade. So I would recommend if you want to, if you want a popularization of it, check out uh, John Borman's film, The, the uh, Excalibur, which is one telling of it. Now, as we get into it, you're going to see that the, that the Grail stories themselves are very diverse. You know, you have, in some cases, uh, you know, you have, you have, it's almost like 
you know, it's it's dreamlike because you know how in a dream <coughs> characters can morph one into another. You know, in your dream, you'll see a character who is somebody, oh, here's somebody you know, you know, somebody in your family, a friend. And then the next thing you know, they've morphed into somebody else, right? The, the Grail stories are very dreamlike in that because characters morph into one another. And when you read one story and then you read another story, you realize that, okay, in this story, it's Anfortas. In this story, it's Bronn. In this story, it's the Fisher King. In this story, it's King Arthur. But they're all playing a similar role, see? In one story, it might be Galahad questing for the Grail. In another story, it's Lancelot. In another story, it's Percival, see? And who finds it? Well, in some of the stories, it's Percival. In other stories, it's Galahad who actually finds the Grail, see? And then the Grail is described in multiple, multifaceted different ways. Like I said, the way that we usually think of it is the form of a cup, a chalice, right? Now that's very interesting because think of a cup. It's, it's a very preeminently a feminine symbol, isn't it? Right? It's a receptacle, right? Things are poured into it. And in, in alchemy, the cup is the alembicum vitrum. The alembicum vitrum is the receptacle in which the alchemical elements are combined to create this transmutation that leads to some higher state of being, whether it's you know usually called the philosopher's stone is what uh, the alchemist is seeking for. And in that, the alembic, the, 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 the container, is where this transmutation takes place. You're going to see once you immerse yourself into this, these stories that they're very alchemical. And when you, when you study alchemy and some of the literature of alchemy and then you study the grail literature, you're going to see that the parallels are quite striking. Because the alchemist is on the quest, right? The alchemist is questing the, the, the philosopher's stone, which is the, the key to all knowledge. It's the key to the rejuvenation of, of nature and the alchemist. And, and in the Grail stories, the knight, whether it's Percival or Galahad, they're on a quest for the, the agency that will restore the wasteland to fertility and to health, it will restore the debilitated king. See, this is, what, this is what's driving this quest. See, because the land has fallen into ruin, right? And the grail is going to restore it. Now, what many people associate with the grail is the idea of the, the chalice that was used by Christ at the Last Supper. There was actually two things. There was a plate and there was a cup used at the Last Supper, right? The plate that bore the, the wafer, then the wafers and then the cup itself that contained the, the blood, right? Well, after the crucifixion, if you know the legend, right, Joseph of Arimathea, who was one of described in the Bible, in the Synoptic Gospels, as being a secret disciple of Christ, right, which is a very interesting illusion. Because once you begin to read through the lines of these stories, you realize that there's much more to these things than meets the eye. Nicodemus was described as one of the disciples that only would come to, to Christ by night. See, again, that there is a sort of a, um, a clandestine element to this. You know? And if you ask if Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were, were clandestine or secret disciples, how many more were there? You see? And, and your, the, the story of how the whole uh, Last Supper was set up is very filled with some very interesting intrigue. You, you, it's clear that there was something going on behind the scenes. Hey, it's Randall here. If you've enjoyed this and want more, I have a lot more in store for you. If you click the link below, you'll get some exclusive material that I'll be releasing over the next several weeks. I think it will really help you make sense out of our hidden past. This is stuff you won't find anywhere else. And the only way to get it is to click the link below and let me know that you want to stay in the loop. Okay, that's all for now. See you soon.